that track the sky collection through sensors and finally what physics we can infer from the data. So I guess without further ado, fasten your seat belts and let's hand it over to Professor Supreet Singh to begin the webinar. Uh, let's, uh, sir, if you're comfortable, we can start it now, I believe. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks so much. You, uh, that was uh, quite a bit. You did, uh, you did some research. <laughs> okay. Um, Thanks. Uh, so when I was uh, asked to give a webinar in the astronomy, physics and astronomy club, um, so I thought uh, we'll talk about, uh, um, as I said, sky, the oldest laboratory and uh, um, the various aspects of it. So then, uh, well, I've been thinking and then I, th I thought, well, um, in order, I don't want to be too um, amateurish. I, I mean, I do really want to give you some content to uh, think about in all aspects is rather a comprehensive point of view. And I'll also be telling you what you can do in an amateur way as well along the way. And so I just want to cover all sorts of concepts here and uh, in the sense the comprehensive bird eye view. Uh, so because I found actually quite recently that not many people even uh, some big shots know about astronomy. So I think this is a uh, right way to introduce it here. Yeah. So uh, how I see it. So uh, let's begin. So this is the sky, our uh, oldest lab. And uh, you can see here in uh, what is a time lapse of uh, Comet Neowise, which was a recent comet which came in. And uh, so I'll be talking, I basically I'll be uh, putting in a lot of uh, ideas and then also a lot of pictures because I know you're here for lovely pictures. <laughs> so, um, but uh, as you see from here, there's a, there's a three part uh, thing to it. Uh, one is observing a phenomena and then is understanding and third is uh, predicting. So I could I mean, I can even uh, flip it and call it engineering, physics, and mathematics. So they all combine here because we, I'm taking the data here, um, making a visual representation of it, and uh, side by side, I'm looking at the physics of it. You, you saw the uh, comet had uh, tails. It had two different tails, in fact, and uh, but and pointing in two different directions. So uh, comet one is an as well phenomena or also find its composition. So in a way, all three things play a major role. And uh, that is what uh, the idea of uh, the whole session today is to how to sort of tell you how these three uh, coming together, feed back to each other, not preceding any one of the, any. Uh, I mean, one doesn't precede anyone, any other. But they just feed back into each other to create a wonderful experience in astronomy. Of course, um, we first must open our windows, and uh, this first thing is to look at uh, the sky with a different view. Um, we've all seen dark skies, but never uh, uh, seen a view like this, I suppose. Not certainly not in the cities. And uh, this is uh, our very own Milky Way. The galaxy which we live in provides a whole lot of things. And this actually is a uh, one patch of Milky Way. It's called the core of Milky Way. You can actually see the uh, um, the various uh, dust. So all these uh, there are dust lanes in the Milky Way. There is huge number of stars. Uh, there are also nebulae um, uh, and the star forming regions. There are actively star formation which is going on and uh, various gases and they all emit in various wavelengths. So it's not, it's the whole electromagnetic spectrum which is here. This particular thing is in optical. So what you're saying is uh, red here corresponds to the hydrogen alpha emission. And uh, there are also blue here. Blue is uh, particularly oxygen O3 emission. So, um, so there's a lot to sky than we have usually imagined. And uh, of course, um, our uh, predecessors have also been looking at 
disky and uh, in fact that was i guess the first thing which caught their fancy in the sense that they saw various uh, things in the sky for instance they saw the sun and the moon and the various phases of the moon and also the various stars and particularly stars in the form of clusters so um probably most probably this is the pleiades cluster uh, of uh, seven stars which we see in the sky so the record keeping has been there uh, since a uh, long time back and uh, the idea is first thing to note is where are all these objects in the sky so the thing is to sort of find them uh, or give them positions in the sky and then of course all of that evolved further and uh, we saw how we see how geometry uh, goes into it that was the first thing which was used uh, in astronomy in fact if you read uh, newton's uh, principia of mathematica uh, the uh, the way um, he developed his all his theories and uh, various things were developed during astronomy in the in those times they were majorly uh, using the geometrical principles and geometry it was later than when uh, calculus came in and i mean the old ideas of uh, analytical calculus developed that we have we sort of study physics in the form which we do today but earlier on it all started with uh, Uh, geometry and why not i mean uh, in newton's uh, law of gravitation in fact predicts that the orbits of planets around the sun are uh, basically conic sections they are either parabola hyperbola or uh, ellipses so um geometry played a huge role in uh, astronomy and uh, of course uh, the beginning does starts with uh, coordinate i mean finding coordinates for objects in the sky so suppose you are an uh, observer who's at the center and you are observing anything in the sky you first would like to put some uh, things in perspective so in order to do that you first you of course need some reference points and uh, you will for instance face yourself towards the north because okay. you have a gives you a particular reference or a zero point so this is we are just looking at the azimuth for that matter okay and then uh, what you do once you have the azimuth you essentially look above overhead uh, so this is basically defining the plane of an observer and once you look over overhead there's a point zenith which is directly overhead you overhead and then there's a point nadir which is exactly below you and there is a a line which joins the north and south which we we'll call the meridian and then if you have any star you can fairly i mean easily find what its coordinates are you just need to give certain projections you just need to project it to your plane and you will give the coordinates which are called alt and azimuth altitude and azimuth so this is a basic simplest coordinate system which you would use to give to specify the locations of objects in the sky so and uh, but remember that this is all tied to a single observer if you go and at a particular location if you go i mean this if you're in here in delhi somewhere at your you you'll see this but if you go somewhere else uh, your altitude and azimuth position of any particular star will change because this is very much tied to where you are so depending on where you are of course there's uh, you, because you're looking north you will see that there's a north celestial pole or uh, there's we there's a we have a star we have a star polaris which is very near uh, the north celestial pole that is how to find where the celestial pole is and uh, then of course you can uh, draw another line um, imaginary line of course just like the meridian which is called the celestial equator which goes from east to west this is just the 90 degrees of it and then um, of course in this system now you see stars rise and set and they do it like this so you'll see a star rise so let me go again 
So you see a star rise and it sets. And uh, on the uh, so on the right, you see another depiction here, which is suppose you are on a on a wonderful clear night. You are lying down on the ground and again as you are lying down, you, you are facing your head is towards towards north. So that is how you are lying along the north south axis. Again, you will see the stars and objects in the sky go around like this. OK, so that's the basic uh, coordinate system, which is the alt azimuth coordinate system or the altitude azimuth coordinate system, which everyone would give. And uh, essentially you. In fact, if you look at it clearly, it's just telling you it's very similar to latitude and longitude because after all you are taking. We are not here. We are not giving the physical distances to the star. What is the distance to the star, but rather just the location on the sky uh, on the sky, which we take it to be a sphere. Okay, so it's a four pi solid angle. So apart from, uh, apart from which place I am at, it will also depend on what time of the day it is. Yeah, exactly that it will because Earth is not spinning, up, but it's. Uh, so since it's orbiting around the sun, so it will also yeah depend on which day it is. And uh, there's reason for that, and that is why you need a coordinate system which probably can be sort of observer independent in some way. OK. Of course, we uh, that would be a completely be an idealization. We don't really have a true observer independent coordinate system, but we can do certain. We can still do some things, um, which I mean, uh, whatever are applicable for our purposes. So for uh, fixed, so let's say our stars, everything are fixed. So for fixed stars, one can uh, form what is called the equatorial coordinate system. Basically, in an equatorial coordinate system, what you have done is you have taken a celestial sphere, essentially just draw a sphere, take Earth and uh, draw a sphere here. And uh, so this is the North Celestial Pole. So just just go back here. So that that was the North Celestial Pole over here. So what have, I've done is I've just straightened it up to uh, brought it here. So rotated it. So now I have the North Celestial Pole and now I can essentially uh, take all these stars and give them coordinates on the basis of the celestial or where they lie on the celestial sphere. So they will have a declination, which is like latitudes, which is going in degrees, and then it will have an what is called the right ascension. So this is the declination and this is the right ascension. The right ascension is essentially it is it can also be written in terms of degrees and it can also be written in terms of what we call hours because essentially you see like latitudes, latitudes go. so this into uh, I mean the degrees into 24 hours so 15 degree for instance will make a one hour. So 360 by 24 and because Earth, as I said, it orbits around the sun. Like so, therefore there would be a plane of the Earth's orbit. So suppose we are looking at from the Earth's field of reference, then it is the sun which is orbiting around the Earth and this would be the plane of the Earth's orbit and the line which the green line here, it's called the ecliptic. The place where the ecliptic and the, we, there's a, the, and the ecliptic is, uh, so, this, so this point is, let me write it here. So this point is the North Celestial Pole, the South Celestial Pole, and this is called the Celestial Equator. Of course, there would be an equator there as well, dividing two hemispheres. And this thing is the ecliptic. And uh, the point, so we haven't chosen where our zero for uh, RA is. So here is how we choose the zero. Basically, we say that the point where the ecliptic uh, uh, intersects the celestial equator, of course, it will do it twice. So we choose the spring equinox. These are the equinoxes, 
where the Earth's axis does not point towards or away from the sun. In June, you see the north side points towards the sun. In uh, uh, December, the north is pointing away from the sun. During equinoxes, it does not point any uh, either away or uh, towards the sun. So there are two of them. We'll take the March equinox and call that the zero. And the tilt angle is 23.5 degrees. It is due to the tilt of our uh, the axis of rotation of the Earth. So that is tilted at 23.5 degrees. So this angle is there. Of course, the so zero of so we can define that. So this is the zero of the RA and zero of RA lies in the east end of great square of Pegasus. So there's a square of Pegasus here and uh, that is where the zero is. So if you want to find zero, you look for Pegasus. So here's where. Uh, Uh, is there a question? Uh, was there a question? No, no, sir, no, sir. Oh, okay. So, um, so this is uh, how the uh, square of Pegasus looks like. It's a picture of mine, and you can see, uh, and Ramada is over here. So this points towards the zero of uh, the zero of RA. So uh, as I said, this is also not a perfect coordinate system because after all uh, the stars. So what this has done is it's basically taken every star and given them a fixed RA and deck. So you take a star which is over here. It has a particular RA right ascension and it has a particular declination. So that means these objects would so this this would work if the stars were not really moving around, but the stars do move around. And so uh, generally this works for certain stars which are fixed. So suppose you are looking at the center of the galaxy. So near the center of the galaxy, you will actually see there there are stars which are actually moving around. So it, during the 26 years, uh, people actually observed the center of our galaxy and found that the stars are going around some empty space and they looked at the orbital time period and they found that these the time period would match uh, uh, the theory if they there was a supermassive black hole which is at the center of at the center of their uh, orbital um, motion and that is where that is how they came up that there should be a supermassive black hole in the center of our own galaxy milky way so the so, our, so in those cases you will see that the RA and the deck, the right ascension and the declination of the objects would change. But suppose we are looking at uh, objects which are really outside our galaxy, really far off. Like for instance, Andromeda, which is 2.26 uh, million light years away, the peculiar motions will not affect the RA and deck too much. So th therefore those will remain fixed. Okay. So. Again, so let us go back, but we this is the celestial coordinate system, but we still want to know what is happening in our own frame because we are observing at from a certain location on Earth and we want to know what is happening there. So we go back and tilt it again. So at any point, this would, would be there would be uh, the horizon of an observer which we formed and there would be a meridian and the celestial pole particular angle. that we at any point uh, where we are, wherever we are, the North Celestial Pole is at a particular angle. So this was the ecliptic and, and at the summer solstice, sun is over here and this is how it, it rises and sets. I mean, uh, uh, so earlier I had uh, uh, the North Celestial Pole was over this side when I made that animation. Now the celestial pole is over on this on that side. So this side is uh, east and this side is west. Earlier it was the opposite round. But anyway, the main point is sun rises and sets um, like that and during the summer solstice. And then this is how sun is traveling around for the whole year. And then when it comes to autumn and uh, spring, it is at the uh, at the equinox. So this is how it goes. And then uh, during the winter, this is the 
how it rises and sets. And that is why we see in the northern hemisphere uh, during winter, we see less of sun and during summer we see quite a lot of sun. And uh, so you here basically you see, as I said, for fixed stars, RA and DEC are the same. But if suppose I want to know what is the right ascension and the declination of sun. So here is how the declination of sun is changing because I told you this is the declination and the declination of the sun therefore goes from plus 23.5 to minus 23.5 through the whole year when it goes through the on the ecliptic like that. OK, so um, since we are talking about the sun, uh, um, it's important how these equinoxes are uh, uh, very crucial. For instance, uh, a Greek uh, mathematician and a philosopher, uh, Eratosthenes, he actually used this effect uh, phenomena that uh, uh, during equinox, um, sun is directly overhead. Pardon. So, and he found that there's a there's a place at Syene where sun is directly overhead, and at another place, Alexandria, which lies on the same meridian. So they lie on the same longitude. That's the important thing. The longitude is the same here. So since they lie on the great circle and the shadow of the pole at Alexandria is at angle seven degrees. So he could work out what is the angle subtended at the center of the Earth, which would also be the same seven degrees. And knowing the distance between the two, he found out that the radius of this great meridian or the great circle, the longitude is, uh, I mean, the circumference is uh, close to 40,000 kilometers, which is very close to the uh, recent, uh, the current estimates of uh, the circumference of Earth. So, of course, um, it takes into account that uh, these are the these are circles and not oblate. But we, we we know there are corrections to that because Earth is spinning and therefore it's slightly flattened at the poles and bulging out at the equator. Excuse but then me, that's sir. how. Yes, sir, I'm having a question. I heard this uh, story. Some days ago, uh, I had a doubt not related to science, but uh, a silly question. Mm -hmm. How can that mathematician know that uh, at uh, Alexandria it is making the sunrise is making seven degrees and well at Sainar is having no shadow at the same time because oh, so they are some 800 kilometers no, no, no. apart, no sir. Yeah, so uh, true. So this observation was made at one particular equinox. So and then he this he, he had the knowledge. So one thing is, of course, the history here. The method is, of course, correct. And then, of course, if we go to history, uh, there is a particular translation which goes uh, from Greek, which goes on to say that. So uh, uh, there's two versions of this popular story. One version is that he actually found out the Earth is round. Uh, that is uh, incorrect completely. It was, I think, uh, the, this story was made by uh, Carl Sagan or something. But the idea is they they knew even before uh, this guy that the Earth is uh, round from Aristotle and uh, their observations of uh, uh, that the if you look at the mast of a ship at sea when it horizon. They knew the Earth is round. Um, so this observation was known at previously that at Syene that uh, it was directly overhead. So this was not made at the same time, but at two different uh, times. So you know at particular equinox you found out that this knowledge was there and then he knew this thing and then he knew this thing as well. And then uh, subsequently you make the observation, not at the same time. OK, OK, sir. So, thank you. Sir. So in a sense, the idea that the equinoxes and again astronomy here, it tells you something completely different. I mean, in the sense, it's not telling you something about the sky, but it's telling you something about our own Earth. And that is again an incredible thing. So um, and something which you cannot really 
I mean, of course, this if you if you know two locations, you can do go there in a in one year. Uh, you can measure these things. I mean, this happens actually twice. A year. I mean, yeah. So you can measure this thing uh, when it be directly overhead, but then you cannot really go around take a ruler and measure the circumference of Earth. <laughs> okay, so so this is how the uh, interesting thing is here. And speaking of sun here, uh, as I said, I'll be putting in uh, bringing in pictures. So this was uh, uh, our own sun on uh, 30th November, just two days two days back. Um, and we were seeing some sun, sunspots on it. The picture I this is the picture I took, and um, so that's something which is wanted to show in the midway. And the interesting thing is these sunspots. Uh, if you look at the sizes of these, um, they're actually bigger than Earth. And these are cold regions where you have uh, the magnetic field of the sun, which is leaking out. And there's also coronal uh, mass ejections which happen there. So it's really fairly interesting bit of physics there. So coming back, um, so what we had was we basically uh, tilted our uh, celestial sphere. It is happening at our So where it is on the, uh, this is the array and where it is, it's the tech. Of course, uh, remember to compute the right. So uh, you know where the array and deck is, but there is a certain thing called the hour angle. You know the stars are rising and setting. So there has to be some quantity which is changing. Okay. Like in the altitude azimuth coordinate system, it was the both altitude and the um, both altitude and the azimuth which change together of uh, any uh, star when it goes around. But this is the beauty of the equatorial coordinate system because we saw that the star will make this particular, um, it will trace this particular path. So therefore the declination of, su or suppose the star is over here, it will go along this particular path, which is the parallel circle to the celestial equator. So it will have a particular declination. So the declination during hill during its tracing the path will not change at all. So declination remains the same. So that is something really nice because we don't really have to worry about two different things now. We don't have to worry about altitude and azimuth together, but we can keep the declination fixed and just so we'll we'll take our telescope and put it at the declination wherever that is. And now what we'll say is, OK, just go around and we'll point our telescope towards the North Celestial Pole. So this is our where our telescope is pointing. I'll come to this point later on as well. So don't worry about it. We don't understand. But uh, the point is that we just need to worry about how the star is just tracing around this particular path, which is the change in one quantity, which is called the hour angle. So the hour angle is essentially given by the local sidereal time at a particular location minus what is the array of the star. So array and the deck are, are known. So once you know array and deck and you know the local uh, sidereal time, you can find what is the R angle. So R angle is the how the star will sort of trace this path. So before coming to the R angle, there's this quantity called local sidereal time. So let me just briefly tell you what it is. Remember, we are defining our time with respect to sun. So that is called the solar time. It is basically the Earth goes around the sun, so and also Earth is rotating. So therefore, uh, it will take 24 hours for it for this sun to come directly overhead. So you start at 12, and you come at 12, sun would be directly overhead. But then, if you are looking at stars, remember. Remember, we want to define things with respect to these stars, which are really far off, not with respect to sun. Star is far off, so it will have the rays are parallel, and therefore the star will come overhead. I mean, it, it, suppose it is overhead at one time, and then Earth rotates uh, and also goes around the sun. And some, so taking both these things into account, the star will come overhead four minutes earlier than sun. So this is the reason why, as uh, one of you mentioned, that there are two effects which are there. One is the rotation and other is the orbit. 
So taking those two into account, the altitude and azimuth or the hour angle. So this is why the hour angle and the local sidereal time. Therefore, the local sidereal time change is defines that the stars will rise at every night subsequent. Suppose a star rose today at uh, uh, 9 p.m. Minute reasons because this will not affect those stars which are uh, near the celestial pole because those stars just go around over here. So when they go around over here, they are called circumpolar stars. They never set or rise. So that is how you see uh, patterns like these. So this is again one of my pictures. This uh, it shows. There are these stars which are rising and they will also set There's also stars over here. But since I'm looking directly at the pole, so there are these stars which do not rise or set. So these are called the circumpolar stars. So therefore uh, you see that uh, there is a particular uh, hour angle which is or the hour angle which is changing um, as the star rises goes uh, to its maximum point and then sets. So and the maximum point will be reached when it crosses the meridian. Remember we we draw we we basically had a line which was drawn between the north and the south and which passes through the zenith. So this is the meridian and when a star rises, it rises from over here, reaches this point C2. C2 is when it is actually at the meridian and this would be at its maximal point in the sky and then it crosses the meridian and starts setting. So this is useful to find out when a star will rise and when it will set and also when it will cross the meridian because uh, when we are using our telescopes which are aligned towards the equatorial pole, so they are in the equatorial coordinate system, we are just following the stars like that. When we are following the stars, of course, there are some limitations. We cannot really go when the stars reach up at the meridian. A telescope has to perform what is called a meridian flip. It goes on and starts to look over. Follows it up and then it follows it down. So it for, performs this flip over here. So therefore, we need to know the precise time when the star would uh, cross the meridian. And the R, R angle tells us that if the R angle is negative, the star lies to the east of meridian. It will cross the meridian, reaching its highest point. And when the sidereal time equals the right ascension. So when the sidereal time would be at, uh, uh, over here at the right ascension. So and then uh, one can therefore go and uh, do all these computations. Uh, I just wanted to mention one needs to be careful here between these uh, degrees and minutes. So we are talking when we are talking about RA, RA also has in terms of minutes, but there are also certain thing called arc minutes. I told you every degree on RA is 1 15th of an hour. It's 360 by 24. So that is uh, uh, 0 0.06667 hour. And then one minute is one or sorry, one second is 1 15th of a minute. And that is this. And this is one arc second here. So it is equal to four seconds. So one arc second is four seconds and 15 minute, 15 arc minutes is actually one minute. So one needs to take into, I mean, you should be careful in talking about arc minutes and actual minutes. So the unit should be carefully taken into account. So again, there's a simple calculation here, which is uh, if you just have a star on a celestial equator with RA equal to six hours, then it lies 90 degrees from the equinox. Remember, we defined that equinox from that square which we drew, uh, uh, the Pegasus square of Pegasus, where the zero, zero RA lies. So it is at the 90 degrees. If it is on the equator, that is if it's here, at, on the celestial equator. But suppose the star has a declination of, uh, let's say, 60 degrees. So it is, it is somewhere here, and it has an RA of six hours, then it lies 45 degrees from. So if you take this celestial equator and draw this uh, prime meridian, 
So it lies 45 degree from here. So you have to take this angle is less than what would have been if it was here. So you have to take that cost of 60 degree into account. So let's take a look at a particular example. This is again another picture of mine. This shows the Cygnus region of Milky Way. So you have the North America Nebula here and there's a Pelican Nebula. The other nebulas like the Butterfly Nebula. There's a star Southern over here and there's a nice star over here, which is a blue star. It's called Deneb. So Deneb actually is a very interesting star. It's actually the magnitude 1.25. It's 19th brightest. Deneb actually was a pole star 18,000 years ago. It was seven degrees from the North Celestial Pole. The reason is the axis Earth of the Earth is uh, processing around uh, the the polar axis. And therefore, the 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 direction towards the pole axis of the Earth points it changes. It's, uh, the rate is 23,500 years or something. So then it will again be the pole star in at 90 uh, 9800 AD. It's a long time, but yeah, this is how astronomy is. But at least there are things. Uh, at least which tells you that things do change. Um, this is actually important. Because you see, we made our coordinate system, which is uh, fixed, but the coordinate system actually changes. So if you if you want to, if somebody has taken an observations and has has written out written down something, let's say he say uh, they say a uh, supernova happened uh, at on this particular date at this particular time, and the location of the supernova was this this this. But then uh, even 200 years down the line, or even 100 years actually. Um, if you want to be precise, things actually change. So the catalogs, actually you will see there are two different catalogs. One is the 1900 catalog, and then now there is the 2000 catalog for this particular millennium, which is going on. So we are using the 2000 catalog. So Deneb has, um, it's really, it's at 14,025, oh, sorry, 14, uh, 1425 light years away. 200,000 uh, times the luminosity of sun, it's highly luminous, 19 times solar mass. It's RA and DEC are these. So, it, and our latitude is 28.7 degree north. I'm just hoping, uh, I mean, I'm just uh, assuming that we are, uh, we are, I mean, I'm taking New Delhi's uh, latitude. So 90 minus 28 gives you 62 degrees. So declination of uh, Deneb is less than 62. So this implies that uh, the NAB is not circumpolar. It rises and it sets. You can actually go out, look, look for, look it up in planetarium programs. You'll actually see that it turns out it does. And you can find out what the rising and the setting time is, as I mentioned, by knowing what is your local sidereal time and uh, using the RA, which is the 20, 20 hour here. So, of course, um, there's a lot of math which goes behind it, but then there are also computational packages which are written. So, for instance, this is the Skyfield uh, astronomy package in Python, uh, which can be used to find all sorts of uh, numbers which are required. So, this is again another way where uh, you see math has gone. Um, it started off with geometry, simple geometry, going from uh, geometry to um, understanding the motions, giving coordinates, uh, looking at various examples therein, and then uh, also has given rise to computer packages now, which are dealing with, I mean, you're do using computer codes to find out all those things. So, yeah, all that. So, um, so I want to switch gears now, and of course, uh, what I'm uh, talking about today is uh, not exhaustive. There are things way beyond these things, but I'm just giving you a concise, brief summary of some of the aspects. So the next thing which I mentioned was understanding the uh, universe. And uh, so that is where the physics uh, becomes important. Um, so here's a particular example. We all know that uh, earlier uh, Ptolemy had given a uh, um, uh, geocentric model of Earth, uh, of uh, the universe, geocentric or the Earth centric. Uh, an observation which is
So this is if you take a photo, this is not my picture. Uh, so if you take a uh, photograph of Mercury and or look at uh, I mean, make a table of its observations um, every day, how it changes, you will see at certain uh, time it will seem to go as if it is going backward in the sky. It's called the retrograde motion. So this is happening because we are not in a geocentric uh, uh, situation, but rather a heliocentric situation as long as the solar system is concerned. I'm not talking about the whole universe here. So when the solar system affects, uh, I mean, as long as solar system uh, is concerned, Earth uh, and Mars all, and all the planets, they are going orbiting the sun. And therefore, you will see that since uh, Mars's uh, orbit lies outside Earth, it can seem apparently as if it has um, overtaken or Earth has overtaken Mars and therefore you see this particular pattern which forms in the sky. So this is something which you have learned about just uh, looking at um, astronomy observations and uh, trying to understand what uh, how things go around happen in our universe. Of course, this is at a solar system level, but this is how the uh, progress took place. Um, of course, one can uh, find out for different or, uh, planets what are their orbital time periods, things like that. And that is how, in fact, the universal law of gravitation came into being. Here's another interesting thing. So, this is I mean, the reason why I want to put all these things in perspective, because often people will come around saying, hey, what does uh, this particular thing do or that? But here's an example, another thing where. Uh, this is actually the uh, picture of. Uh, uh, OK, so I have lots of pictures here. Some are mine and some are not mine. So whichever are mine, I will actually mention which are mine. So. Again, okay, this one is not mine. So um, you've seen, uh, so basically this is uh, during an eclipse and you see the chromosphere of sun and you look at the spectrum of the chromosphere of the sun. So that tells you what elements are there. You will see that major number of spectral lines are contributed by hydrogen. There these yellow, this particular yellow line is actually contributed by helium. Helium was the element which was actually first discovered in the sky, and that is why its name is helium. It comes from Helios. It was observed on October. Uh, the evidence was observed on August uh, 18, 1868, uh, with this wavelength by French astronomer observed it. And, uh, so, and there was a confusion slightly because the Sodium doublet also lies very near it, but the the intensity of the uh, helium line is way higher than uh, the sodium doublet. So that's how. And then it was later on. It was also seen in terrestrial laboratories, and of course, yeah, you know, uh, liquid helium is currently used to cool down to temperatures uh, uh, to low low temperatures and do cryogenic stuff and like that. So here's how astronomy goes in and you understand some physics and it goes back to engineering and a whole lot of stuff. So here's some examples where theories led to discoveries. Then um, again, inexhaustive uh, list. There's a whole lot of things. So I'm just telling you certain uh, things which. Um, so this using Newtonian gravity, Alexis Bovard published tables of Uranus found that, uh, but then there were observations which found the discrepancies. And therefore, uh, using perturbation theory, Leverier told astronomers to look for a planet at calculated locations. He calculated that within one degrees that sh there should be another planet, and the astronomers went back and looked at where the locations Verrier gave, and they found Neptune. Excuse me, sir. Planet Neptune, yeah. Sir, could you um, explain in simple terms what is perturbation theory? OK, yeah, sure. So um, you use uh, the in order to find the orbits, you basically use uh, first thing. So you need to 
so what are the okay here's the thing perturbation is a slight change that is what you define perturbation as even if you go to look up oxford dictionary that is what it is it's a small That's change a nudge. Okay? yeah okay. yeah so in physics too this is what it means in the sense that you are looking at the orbit of uranus when in the gravitational field of sun but then there were some discrepancies here so therefore they said there has to be something which is changing the orbit of uranus slightly something nearby which could be massive so therefore you look for corrections to the orbit of uranus due to a particular body so the corrections are what are called the perturbation theory that is you write something which is at the zeroth order is the field due to sun and then at the first order you are looking for corrections so that is what is perturbation theory and it's basically a perturbation to newton in the gravity newton theory itself is using the newton theory again i mean it's nothing outside newtonian theory it's still in newtonian theory a small correction to it Okay. So Leverrier actually discovered Newton, uh, sorry Neptune, from calculations alone. So here's an example where Neptune, a planet, was discovered just using pen and paper. And uh, so they found Neptune, and the same, and this was actually the triumph of Newton's theory of gravitation, because Newton's gravity had been used to discover something. entirely new okay. so uh, the but then uh, it so happened that leverrier also found 43 arc second per helian shift of mercury and this could not be explained using newtonian uh, gravity so in one case uh, he found something uh, which triumph which uh, won the praise for newtonian gravity that it proved that newtonian gravity is indeed correct and then he found something which where newtonian gravity also fails and subsequently it it so happened that the einstein theory of gravity uh, it it computes the correct number for uh, this perihelion shift of mercury the reason is uh, this is happening close to the sun so relativistic effects are important and uh, this is happening far away from the sun so newton perturbation to newtonian effects are uh, uh, sufficient to um, explain the phenomena here if you do perturbations of the newtonian gravity you cannot do that okay sir so yes how can they find the that small perihelion shift in 19th century itself uh, oh, how could okay, they yes. so do that? yeah yeah so the perihelion shift of mercury is actually not really 40, 43 arc seconds it so happens uh, to change the orbit of mercury you need uh, the you need to have uh, incorporate effects of all the bodies uh, and sun is one particular body and then there's jupiter which exerts a whole lot of uh, gravitational influence uh, on other planets and uh, other there then there are other planets too saturn and all that so the total perihelion shift of mercury is actually around 1000 arc second per century okay so that is observable uh you observe the transit of mercury when you observe the transit of mercury you can actually find out what is the time period of mercury and using the time period you can do a calculation and then compute what would be the perihelion shift so perihelion shift was found but then you then subtract from it what are the contributions from jupiter and everything and that leaves you the contribution from this uh sun alone this the 43 arc second is on the contribution due to uh only due to the sun is there so it's only due to sun and that's how it was uh, found so einstein um kept computing the perihel so in fact einstein came up with lots of different theories of gravity all and he kept computing 43 arc second this perihelion shift and uh, he found the wrong numbers for each of them and he stopped when he found the right number that, that is what where we are at the moment so and this effect is uh, actually a very so i just want to remark that this effect is very uh, uh, precise effect of solar uh, of einstein's gravity because there was another effect due to einstein gravity which is the bending of light uh, bending of light can be given by a, a again if you do a linear perturbation theory that is if you start off with a, a flat space time 
and do write what is the linear order uh, change to a flat space time, you can get the bending of light, but you cannot get the perihelion shift. This is a non-linear effect, whereas uh, gravitational, uh, the bending of light you can still get. But of course, Newtonian gravity gave the bending of light the factor to be two, whereas uh, Einstein theory gave it a factor of four. So, and Eddington and teams, uh, solar eclipse observations of 1919, confirmed uh, general relativity. So there's a nice article on this. It's called the British Ex Expeditions of uh, 1919 and before. So there were also another expedition in 1912. There's a history of science thing. So there was a there was an eclipse in 1912 and Einstein had. Uh, so the, the theory Einstein had come up with earlier in 1912, it predicted the wrong uh, number for bending of light. It so happened the weather was not favorable, so those ob observations were not made. And if they were had, they had been made. Einstein's theory gave a wrong number, so and the observations would not have pointed to it. Einstein did those calculations again. Um, he found his own theoretical discrepancy there, so therefore he did them and found the result to be predicted. The result to be four. And in 1919, again there were two places where this was taken. Um, in Brazil and in Africa, um, I think it was Europe. I don't recollect. Uh, you can check. Um, and then uh, Eddington chose the so they actually they gave two two different values. Eddington chose the value which confirmed which sort of was uh, consistent with Einstein's theory. So that's how it was found. But anyway, in nonetheless, um, this has been seen to be uh, uh, quite a uh, precise thing now with current observations. Uh, of course, just wanted to point out this was the uh, the system again. So here is where the engineering is going. The telescope system and everything which was used by Eddington to and the photographic plates were used at that time. No CCDs or CMOS imaging to the, uh, uh, the location of the stars before the eclipse and uh, and during the eclipse. So they they basically took a photograph of the sky of the stars at which would be occurring just near the sun before uh, the eclipse. So that was taken at night. OK, so considerably time before that uh, they found that these stars will come up there. So when they appeared at night at the same location, they took the photograph and then they took a photograph during the eclipse and compared the two and found that the uh, the locations had changed. Um, here's where uh, GR general relativity has been important in the global positioning system. You need to correct for uh, the satellites uh, and every uh, six minutes or so, I think, and that gives you the precise uh, GPS positions in your Google Maps uh, or Apple Maps. And uh, so this is, uh, as I said, what was happening uh, to the bending of light. So you had the uh, stars, then their actual positions was shifted during due to the gravitational field of the sun. Curvature of space of the gravity of sun. But this thing uh, which uh, has been observed also for other th cases, like for instance, if you have a galaxy, if you have a galaxy far away and then you have a galaxy cluster in between and you are observing this galaxy uh, around and through this cluster, the lights are bent by the gravitational field of the cluster in between, and therefore it forms what is this. It basically is focusing these light rays. So since the light rays are getting focused, this forms what is called a gravitational lens and the gravitational lens uh, lenses have been seen. So here are examples of uh, gravitational lenses. Um, you see these uh, uh, rings. So this the ring is basically the galaxy which lies behind this cluster. So all these rings are formed due to the lensing due to this cluster. Here's a particular one. It looks like a smiley. Um, so again, this is a gravitational lens. A ring is so these the rings are the the galaxy which lies behind this gravitational cluster. And and the theory uh, general relativity it uh, predicts these lenses can be used here and so to a high precision. Interestingly, um, 
We also saw a lensing version. This is again a lensing kind of an effect due to a black hole, which uh, gave rise to a row. We saw a picture of a black hole, sort of an image of a black hole uh, in M87 galaxy, which was given by uh, published by the team at uh, Event Horizon Telescope, uh, which basically is again, this is working in radio astronomy. You're looking at um, uh, at a supermassive at a supermassive black hole in the center of a galaxy M87, which looks like this. Um, and there is an accretion disk around the black hole because the black hole is accreting mass. And so the accretion disk emits light and that light is sort of bent by the field of this, this, this uh, black hole. And this is what you see around this black hole. So there's a shadow region which you cannot see. So you want horizon there. And uh, then you see the what is the photon sphere, which is around the black hole. So we found that this, this is 6.5 billion times the mass of the sun. I mean, you can you first do the observations, use theory, and then you predict quantities. Um, it eats up, the accretion rate is 90 Earth mass per day. Um, angular diameter is 42 uh, micro arc second. So just to, that's the angular diameter here. Um, just to put in perspective of its uh, what its size is, suppose uh, we put sun at the center, uh, the orbit of Pluto would be over here, and uh, that is where Voyager 1 has gone up till now. So this is sort of the size of that uh, black hole, uh, the event or the shadow of the black hole region. It's basically telling you, you the radius of uh, um, around 2.6 times uh, Schwarzschild radius of the black hole. But then uh, we can go even further. Uh, this is what we do in astronomy. We can uh, look for farther and farther away. And Sir, as, yes. For a black hole, what is the difference between uh, event horizon and a proton sphere? A photon sphere. A, a photon, photon sphere. sphere. If you go and look up, you'll find that uh, event horizon is the location wherein uh, you, so it's the if, suppose, so it's basically like it's, um, if you cross the event horizon, uh, the uh, geometry changes such that you, uh, no causal influence from inside can come out. So it's like the, no, it's like a membrane or kind of like a one, one way membrane. You can only go in and not come out. Okay. Photon sphere is the last stable circular orbit of photons. So you can orbit a black hole as well. I mean, uh, it's not a unusual thing as long as you are sufficiently outside. So this is the location where the photons or light can or massless particles can orbit a black hole uh, stably. So that is around. So the if you take a black hole, which is like what is called, uh, which is a spherically symmetric, which is not spinning at all or something like that. It is, it's like standing on its own. Um, for that black hole, if the mass is, let's say, capital M, then the Schwarzschild radius or the event horizon, I mean, it's called a Schwarzschild black hole. That is why I'm calling it a Schwarzschild radius. The event horizon lies at the location GM, uh, 2GM by uh, C square. That is the location of the if you in kilometers. So that is basically three kilometers uh, m by m of sun. So it should. So it is for it is three kilometers for our sun. The this particular radius. So you can put in any particular mass in it and find what would be the radius for that particular. Mass. So that is that. And uh, the photon sphere, as I said, is the stable orbit of photons around a black hole. And that lies at um, uh, three by two times the uh, for the uh, event horizon. So it lies outside the event horizon. So it 1.5 times the event horizon outside the black hole. OK, so as I was saying, um, we can go further. And if you go further, we can actually see um, we're actually overshoot already overshot our time. Um, okay, 
So let me know how far I can go. In any way, OK, let me continue. So um, we, we can actually go and find out what is. Uh, I mean, we are getting light from far off from the universe. We are basically looking into the past. Okay. So we're looking at a galaxy where uh, the light from a galaxy takes Andromeda is 2 point. Uh, I said around 2.26 million light years away. So we're looking at the past. So we're looking really far off. In particular, of course, we are looking the first light of our universe was the cosmic microwave background. It looks like something like that. And uh, it, it tells you that universe is almost homogeneous and isotropic. It's almost same and equal in all directions, except for the small spots, uh, uh, which are uh, one, one in uh, a million, one part in a million, 10 to the power minus 5. And it, it was completely homogeneous, like just single color. Uh, we would not have been uh, formed any structures on it, anything like that. It would have been pretty boring. It is all these small spots everywhere, which are the ones which uh, went on to uh, to form the large scale structures and the galaxies and everything which we see today. So these small things are the small perturbations. So this is, uh, as I somebody said, perturbations. So these are so if you take one single color and put all these small dots on them, these are the perturbations again. So these, this is again a kind of physics which we gather from, uh, from astronomy. Um, as I said uh, in this previous uh, picture, there's there's a lot of things which we still do not know about our universe, particularly the late time phase of our universe, which um, the all the things which we see in our universe, the galaxies and every stars and everything. Uh, they form visible matter, which is just 5% of uh, the total content of our universe. Rest of the 95% is actually something uh, mysterious, still not known. People are trying to find out more about it. Um, some of it is called dark energy. Other thing is called dark matter. We're still trying to work on it. Um, uh, so there's something, some work which I have also done regarding the dark energy and dark matter. We're still trying to understand how your universe is evolving by looking at observations. So the what I wanted to point out here is that you make models and then using these models you and then you use observations and try to uh, check or fit these models and uh, see how these models uh, perform with the data. And that is how you get to understand more of physics and uh, data together. So here's another thing which I'm uh, working on right at the moment. Uh, this, that was a previous work there, and here is something which we are working on right now. Um, uh, not this one. This I mean, here is already. So this is basically a map of the magnetic field of Milky Way. Our galaxy Milky Way has magnetic field. So here's, suppose here's a galaxy whirlpool galaxy. This is 22 million light years away, and one can find what is the map of uh, magnetic field in whirlpool galaxy by looking at synchrotron radiation from this galaxy. So similarly, there's a magnetic field in our Milky Way, and this is this comes from uh, those CMB observations, the cosmic microwave observations I previously mentioned. But then you can also get the magnetic field of Milky Way through other way, ways, as I mentioned, through synchrotron radiation. And there you use what are called pulsars. So this is that uh, Whirlpool galaxy. So imagine you have uh, objects in our universe which are like these lighthouses. It's just beaming at you. OK, so. Um, so here's a particular pulsar, so you can use the pulsar, which is, uh, for instance, uh, uh, this is called the crab pulsar. It uh, it emits in all wavelengths. So you saw in so it starts from radio. The red is the radio, then there is infrared, there is optical, UV, and then X-ray. So this is a pulse galaxy, which are basically neutron stars rapidly spinning, and uh, they also have accretion disk and radio jets. So you look them in radio, and if there is a magnetic field in between a pulsar and our us, between us and the pulsar, the magnetic field will rotate the light the polarization of the light coming from these pulsars 
And from the rotation, you can find what is the magnetic field of our galaxy, which is what uh, uh, we are trying to do now. So and uh, finally, uh, I've been talking about electromagnetic waves and then there is also the gravitational waves, which you I guess would have heard about a lot. So this is a whole new aspect of astronomy, which is called the gravitational wave astronomy, which has come up. So with this, I they have com concluded the second part and now move on to the third part, which would be slightly quicker than the first one. Uh, so here I just want um, to mention how me, we. Yes. Uh, yeah, just before that, I had a small doubt in the cosmic microwave background part. Uh, I had heard somewhere about the cold spots that uh, we uh, see in the CMB. Can you explain or clarify something on that, please? Yeah, I certainly I can do that. So we go to this thing. So um, when you see these uh, spots over here, so all of these like um, anisotropies. Um, so basically, as I tell, this is based, this what what is this map of? What is this telling you? This is actually a map of the temperature. So essentially, you take a telescope. So this is a microwave telescope, and it's on a satellite. It's called the Planck satellite, which is orbiting. So this has basically antennas antennas um, and so you basically observe temperature in one part of part of the sky so I suppose over here and you observe temperature over here and then you find the correlation of the temperatures between them between the two points and what this is are these are the correlations of the temperatures which have been plotted so blues are the so you will see that the temperatures that as I said the universe is homogeneous and isotropic so there would be so the first so when you find you do those observations and you draw those temperatures, you will see that they will get only one color. Let's call it red. OK, and then from the red color, you subtract out various contributions. You subtract out contributions from the motion of the Earth. You want to find pure uh, microwave background, which is their light. So you find uh, you subtract those out and then you find these spots. So these spots are, as I said, small spots. So this is the blue spots are the cold spots and the red ones are the um, hot spots. Uh, so basically the homogeneous thing is around 2.7 Kelvin. So there's a 2.7 Kelvin underneath and the red ones are 2.7 Kelvin plus 10 to the power minus 5. And uh, blue ones are 2.7 Kelvin minus 10 to the power minus 5. So this are plus minus 10, uh, 10 power minus 5 on top of 2.5, 2.7 Kelvin. So these are the hot and cold over the homogeneous thing. Um, but now you can go ahead and do various things with it. These are like random. Uh, you'll see how because the photons are coming us coming to us. This Gaussian random field. You can do statistics physics. You can try to find what is uh, the thing is called. Uh, well, you'll say it does not really look isotropic to me. Is there a preferred direction in our universe? That is, is there a iso and is there an anisotropy? So you can run statistics and find out what is called the st statistical anisotropy uh, using these numbers. Um, they are called bipolar spherical harmonics. Uh, and then you will you can divide. You will find it. It's it has been found again. This is uh, ongoing stuff. What, you, what has been found is that there is a portion of this. So it starts from over here. So I draw a line. It goes like this. So all towards the left portion has been found to be slightly hotter or colder than the other one. So there seems to be a preferred direction in the sky. So that is called the cold spot anomaly. Um, we still do not know what it uh, really comes from. It could be a systematic effect. It could be an error in our observations. It could also be some new physics. It could also it could be. So that's how you see something and then you try to uh, build models for it and then you do further observations and then try to rule out those models. So that is how things go out in uh, loop. So there are different explanations for it and we need more observations so that we can rule out some of them and find what is the correct one. So that is the cold spot anomaly which is there. And uh, so I hope that answers your question. Yes, sir. Thank you.
Okay, so, so brings us to the last part of our talk, which is gathering the data. Here it is where the some bit of engineering goes in, and also somewhat I'll mention the amateur astronomy aspects, which um, everyone can also do. So, um, so science and technology, as I said, is the amalgamation of basic sciences and engineering. So we in India are already contributing a great deal in astronomy and astrophysics. We have some uh, projects of our own, and then we are also part of uh, some uh, multinational projects. So the liquid mirror telescope. So it is the international liquid mirror, mirror telescope. This mirror is actually liquid mercury. So in order to form a concave shape, this platform needs to rotate. When it rotates, liquid when the liquid rotate it forms that curve curved thing the, due to the Coriolis effect and so it will form a mirror a curved mirror and uh, that is how it can function in a telescope this is the first liquid mirror telescope of its type which is uh, being used i mean there have been prototypes which are made the original concept goes back to 1800s but technology was not developed at that time I mean, people know knew about that this thing could be used but it wasn't there. And then there were prototypes which were made recently. And now this one is the one which will actually be used for uh, surveys. So this is uh, uh, four meter. Equivalent four meter mirror would cost 10 times the this particular mirror's cost. But of course, this particular mirror would have a lifetime and all those things. So this is India, Belgium, and Canada. And then there is the 30 meter telescope which is being built. Um, then there is the radio astronomy, which is the square kilometer array, uh, which is going to come up. Uh, there's 14 uh, countries and India, which is which is involved in it. So all sorts. And I mean, this again, as I said, whatever I am talking today is in. I mean, uh, is only a sample of a bigger thing. So there are a lot many projects. There. But yeah, I mean, you you can do something of your own too. Uh, you just need some. You need some a decent camera, extra batteries, lens, tripod, ball head, an intervalometer in order to take pictures, uh, long exposures, um, a simple application, Sky Safari, computer, and softwares in order to work with these images. Of course, you want to stay up the night, so you need some coffee too. Of course, you don't forget the mosquito repellent and flashlight. So, just to um, of course, um, you'll be installing a camera on a tripod or something and taking some pictures. And as you saw, stars move around. Um, you will see those star trails coming up. So I just wanted to give you a, a slight thing here. Um, we don't, I mean, ideally we should be tracking the stars. That is why I said we need to track the stars. We'll come to that. But um, there's a certain thing that the perceived motion of the stars is actually depends on the field of view. It's basically the parallax effect. So the more closer you will be watching the smaller field of view, the more apparent would be the field, uh, motion of the star. So if you have a wide field of view, it will take the time for the star to grow from go from one point to the other point of the sensor. So there's a rule of 500, which basically tells if you have a focal length of a lens, let's take a 50 millimeter lens. And if you have an APS-C camera, it basically tells you what size if your is the sensor of your camera. So APS-C camera has a crop factor of 1.5. So therefore, you can find the exposure time. It would be around six seconds. You can expose for six seconds. You can take six second images without seeing a significant uh, trail in your images. Okay. So um, of course. Um, it's not good enough for signal to noise ratio in a single image because we are after all look, looking at very faintest of objects in the sky. So you take large number of images and uh, do statistics. That is how we improve the signal to noise ratio there. So that, that is where the digital signal processing goes in. So um, objects and field of view, some examples I just wanted to point out for which you can uh, look at. So these are, uh, websites where you can look for various objects look you can give what is your focal length what camera you're using and uh, it'll tell you what is the field of view you'll have <coughs> you're looking at <coughs> just a, just a second 
So, <clears throat> as I said, ideally you want to track the objects, and this is where equatorial mounts come in. That is, uh, as I said, you have aligned your scope. You there's a polar axis. You align your uh, mount towards the north celestial pole, and now once you set where is your declination, you uh, you just have to go around. This basically goes around this particular axis, rotates around this axis because the stars will rise and it will set. So therefore, uh, you just need to worry about the, uh, as I said, the RA, right ascension, or the R angle, which comes about. So this is a typical uh, equatorial mount. It's basically you have a declination shaft, RA shaft. So here's again the engineering aspect which is going in. You need all these instrumentation to deal with uh, to get gather data and all that because you want to do take long long exposures. So you have these uh, warm wheels and motors and gears and how you need to work them out in order to perform the precise motion. You cannot really uh, rotate this thing at arbitrary uh, speeds. This has to be a precise tracking which goes in and all those things uh, come and play a part here. Um, you can also use altitude azimuth systems. In fact, uh, professional ones use an altitude system because uh, they're easier to use. <clears throat> the only issue here is you have to track both. You have to change both altitude and azimuth. So this goes around in azimuth and this goes around in altitude together. In equatorial, you just need to move only one degree of freedom once you have set the declination shaft. Here you need to change both of them together. Um, the re, the only thing is here what happens in in the equatorial case since you are moving in only one direction this square is your camera sensor so you see that the image remains the same but in alt azimuth system your camera is like this but your field of view rotates so this would be field of view at one time and this would be a field of view at another time so you need to rotate your camera as well so wherever you attach your camera you attach what is called a field d rotator which basically as the as you track the uh, object, you also rotate the camera. So you simultaneously rotate the camera to keep it, keep the object in the same uh, as, as the same field of view. Same orientation. So again, uh, coming back to some of the pictures which I've taken, um, this is the comet Neowise, another picture of that. Um, this is a crescent nebula in the sky, which is a supernova remnant. Uh, this is the elephant trunk nebula. Uh, primarily, you see the emissions are in hydrogen alpha because they appear red. <clears throat> um, the alt azimuth systems which I mentioned here are actually important because uh, they're particularly useful to if you want to locate phenomena which are transient because you see comets, as I said, equatorial systems are with respect to fixed stars. But suppose you want to track a comet. Comet does not have a fixed RA and declination, right ascension and declination. So if you have an equatorial system that will require both things to move simultaneously again, your declination will also be moving, not just your RA. So it's better, easier to use an alt azimuth system for transient phenomena. That is, just wanted to mention that. These mounts are controlled uh, through softwares. Uh, this is all computerized systems which go in. Again, the engineering aspect which goes in. Uh, so this this piece of part of the talk is based mostly about engineering. So it's all computerized. You tell the mount where to point. You give it location. You give it basically the object, and it will point there. They're called go-to mounts, and uh, it'll start tracking the various numbers to take care of, which all you're looking at. So there are the planetarium apps. Uh, there are the apps in which allow you take allow you to take exposures uh, to control your camera and take exposures. So there are these control systems. Um, a simple amateur astronomer would use uh, you could actually use a simple uh, Raspberry Pi. Um, a Raspberry Pi can be used to control the whole uh, um, amateur uh, setup. Uh, it's just a palm sized computer. I'm sure you must have come across this particular thing. So um, 
It controls various things, mounts, cameras, filter wheels, focusers, and other peripherals which are there. Then there's the telescopes. We, can, we have different types of telescopes which are used in astronomy. We have the refractors, smith cassegrains Matskos, there's the Celestron Rasa. Uh, Newtonian reflectors, the simple ones, which are, so these are the ones where the, this is the one with lenses, and then these are the ones which have mirrors. So these, the mirrors types are uh, various kinds, depending upon what is the uh, applicability. If you want to uh, look for certain particular applications, uh, then there are solar scopes. Solar scopes are particularly for meant for sun. You, you know that you cannot safely view the sun through without using any uh, uh, filters or special kinds. So you look for what are called etalons. So suppose you want to single out a particular wavelength in sun. Let's say you want to observe sun in hydrogen alpha. So a simple filter will not. You want a, a very fine uh, filtration. So etalon is basically a cavity, which uh, optical cavity, which filters out uh, a particular wavelength, which is resonant with that cavity. So you use that to filter out H alpha, for instance, and solar scopes are used for that case. And then uh, here's where the optics goes in. You have uh, light which is coming around and you want the, op the different wavelengths to be focused at the same point. So the optical elements need to take into account how the um, different wavelengths are focused at the same points and it should be free of all aberrations. So otherwise you'll see these aberrations which will come around. So again, optical engineering, lens designing goes in there. Coming back again, these are some of my own pictures. Uh, this is a picture of a Rosette Nebula, uh, a Whirlpool Galaxy, particular Bode's galaxy. This is the Whirlpool galaxy which I mentioned. The magnetic field is uh, when I was mentioning the magnetic field. So 26 million light years away, uh, a Bode's galaxy 22 million light, light years away. So I mean this is something <laughs> when we are talking about vast distance distances such as these. Um, so you're getting photons from such distances. This is actually a nice website. It's called if uh, it's I think it's called yeah it's called if moon were one pixel so search and look at it you will see the if you want to know the distances uh, even in our solar system how great are the distances so you'll find out um, I mean it takes hours from for light to go from sun to uh, Pluto. So you can so in that in, in that website you will actually there's a nice illustration infographic in which you can scroll and it can automatically scroll from sun to Pluto and if you move at the speed of light you will uh, take I think it was around five hours or something to go from sun to Pluto so you'll have to scroll for that many time so you have to be so that tests your patience if and if you're not patient enough for five hours. Try being patient for patient for uh, uh, 26 million light years. Uh, OK, so um, we have the cameras here. Uh, we use special cameras which are cooled sensors. Uh, we want low read noises. As I said, we are capturing faintest of the objects. Photons come randomly. They're not coming like so you you will receive a photon in one uh, in particular exposure. You may not receive it in the next exposure, things like that. So it signal signal to noise ratios are very minuscule. So we take either we can take long exposures or we take a large number of small frames and then use statistics. We average them out and get a good a signal to noise. We increase the signal to noise ratio by taking large number of observations. This is the simple statistic tool. This is where the statistics play. statistics in imaging, but then of course there's a much bigger statistics which is used when we want to understand the physics later on. So you get images like these. There's a read noise there. There are there's, so you need to calibrate all these images which you get. You calibrate them with the read with the noise in your camera. You calibrate them with the uh, uh, effects in the optics, and then you get the final image after all these calibrations. So if you're using a normal DSLR, you could also go and uh, 
uh, normal DSLRs are not very sensitive to hydrogen alpha, which is the main wavelength which we are looking at in uh, astronomy. You can go ahead and modify the sensors. The sensor actually has a filter on top of it. You can remove that filter and reinstall it back in. These are called modified DSLRs, which can be used also to capture hydrogen alpha. This is a modification which I did once uh, with this particular DSLR. So um, as, as I said, uh, one can do uh, one when uh, when one wants to do physics, we want to uh, understand light coming from different sources in different wavelengths. So we need filters for that and spectrographs. So they single out certain wavelengths, like for example, H alpha or oxygen wavelength and so on. This is, for instance, image of sun into three different uh, wavelengths, hydrogen alpha, calcium uh, uh, thing and uh, batter, uh, calcium potential, potassium thing. Uh, this is just a normal white light filter, simple thing as you observe. And uh, using various properties of st the stars, as you know, where it is, peaking, it is peaking, you can find what is the temperature of the star and you can also find what is the luminosity of the star and you can therefore plot it and actually find, draw what is called a Hertzsprung Russell diagram. This tells you where the star is in its life cycle. Our sun is over here and this is where the red giants are. It have it, They have this temperature and they are this luminous. Deneb is somewhere here. That star Deneb, which I talked about, 19 solar masses, 200,000 times luminous as sun, somewhere over here. It's a blue star. Blue means it's a very, so it's a blue giant somewhere here. Uh, this is where the beetle geese, which is a star in Orion, that is over here. So Deneb is over here. So um, in order to therefore use these filters, again, another fe feature of engineering goes in, you need to define, de design filters and uh, you need specific materials which will filter these wavelengths and also they do not they do we do not want any aberrations coming from those things when we uh, use them in our optical train between the telescope and the camera so all these things are important thin films etc which will go therein and uh, so when you use all those things, you get images like these. So this is again another image of mine. This is a wheel supernova. This is a supernova remnant, and a remnant of a supernova which exploded um, 6,000 years ago, I think. And uh, you see a nice, so red is the mainly, it's the hydrogen, H alpha, and blue is uh, oxygen. But there are other uh, emission uh, elements as well. Actually, supernovas are the ones which uh, give rise to heavy elements and uh, we are all made up of stuff which probably which not probably which actually uh, got made in one such supernova explosion so we are all star stuff um so again just to want what i mentioned we need all sorts of things there we need uh, to reduce aberrations so there are these optical stuff which we need to use um just last thing which i want to mention is which i want to mention is uh, there's a thing called adaptive optics. We have our, we're looking through our atmosphere and atmosphere is uh, turbulent. So it gives rise to atmos the phenomena of atmospheric seeing. Basically the wave, the light which is coming from here, due to turbulence, it gets distorted. And therefore there are techniques to how to um, reduce this distortion. So you basically try to find out what this distortion is using and using the detector wave from detector and then uh, compute a distortion and then you basically deform the mirror in order to nullify the distortion and get the undistorted wavefronts so this is the way it is done in order to get the effect how to what what should be used to correct for the uh, the distortions we also make what are called artificial stars so you shine a laser and in the ionosphere, you make these uh, stars which emit sodium wavelength and you observe them first and get the distortions and then you correct for the distortions. And sometimes this is all done in real time. So this is all done in real times. This is something which you would observe in uh, when there is turbulence and this is when you observe and you correct for the turbulence. So adaptive optics is certain something which is used here. But yeah, as I am saying, in all these aspects, it is the physics which guides you. 
uh, you need to know what you need to be working for here. So it is the longer wavelengths or the infrared wavelengths which are affected most by atmospheric turbulence. So it's not just that you go and do some engineering and you will get the thing. You need to do the physics. Be, you need to know the physics behind it well in order to do a proper engineering and get the proper result. So um, then there is something called guiding. It is basically uh, the idea that you the if you if you have a mount which is not properly tracking, you can use is similar to the adaptive optics. You can use a star, a guide star. This gives correction to the mounts. The mount moves somewhere. This will tell the mount, hey, move back. So this is guiding the mount. You are tracking as well as guiding the mount as it moves around. So um, uh, you can do a lot of things with uh, uh, simple astronomy setups. I just wanted to mention this particular aspect here. With simple uh, setups, this is the science which can be done in optical. You can find out the brightness of variable star. You can look for exoplanets. You can look for star formation regions in our Milky Way galaxy. Uh, you can draw the HR diagram, as I mentioned. Uh, kinematics, solar disk activity, search for transients, study Andromeda with simple, with simple uh, telescopes. But then if with complicated, even complex telescopes, you can do a lot more further, go further than that. So, um, so this is the final thing which I want to mention. Uh, uh, something is very uh, appalling is the state of uh, skies at the moment uh, in our uh, cities and places. We are all uh, into, um, we all have so much light pollution, dust pollution that the skies are really getting wiped out. It's something which is, uh, I personally want to just want to make this point that uh, it is quite imperative. I mean, people have not even seen stars in their own lifetimes if they will grow up in an environment like this. Um, so it is important that uh, any progress which we make in anything is just want to point out the ethical aspects of it. If we make a progress which uh, leads us to something like this, I really do not uh, call it any progress. So something to look for, look something to look at, uh, ponder upon uh, the uh, aspects uh, of light pollution. And uh, so this is where I end. Um, I've taken 34 minutes extra. But anyhow, I hope you found it uh, interesting. Uh, astronomy, as you've seen, astronomy and astrophysics is an uh, amalgamation of engineering, basic sciences and mathematics. It takes into account all possible. Uh, in fact, even within these fields, it takes into account. It requires all sorts of every aspects of these fields together. Um, and you need to uh, if you want to look at it. And uh, if uh, you pour your heart out to it, uh, it will give you immense joy. Thank you.